Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hello. I'm going to get started. I'm a couple of minutes behind. Oh, hello. Hey, good to see you. Thanks for coming. What are you doing here? You know this stuff. Uh, good morning. Hi. Uh, my name is Sebastian Long, um, and we're going to talk about expert reviews this morning. Uh, firstly, thanks for being here. It's great. If you don't know already, this is the foundations track. This is designed for uh, novice and entry-level user researchers, but this is a pretty weird talk in that uh, I'm talking a bit about things that are relevant to training. So for those of you who are also trainers or training games user researchers, hello, welcome. Uh, a bit about me, I'm the director of player research. Uh, we're an independent uh, consultancy on the topic of games user research, providing research services to the rest of the games industry that doesn't have their own internal teams. Uh, I've done seven years as a user experience research consultant, uh, but because we're a small company, I'm also doing things like hiring, managing, training, uh, sales, uh, lab development, and all the fun stuff that comes with, as, uh, with being a startup. I've written about 100 of these things called expert analyses for video game studios, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, let's get started. First of all, though, I'm dual-wielding clickers today, one for these and one for this, so if I get a bit mixed up, then sorry, just like put your hand up and I'll try and catch up. Uh, yeah, two, something about juggling two tasks at the same time, I feel. Anyway, uh, all right. If we're going to talk about expert analyses, let's start right at the beginning. Uh, what are we all here to do? Actually, I'm going to duplicate what Randy said upstairs, which was uh, the games user research, we are here to contribute insight about players' attitudes and behaviours to inform creative decisions throughout development, thereby improving game design. This is what we're all here to do. And expert reviews are a process designed to help us do this. One of many methods we have available to us in our toolkit to help get this done and make games better. There are process for structured evaluation of a product, not just for games, but for all things, all products. There are a mainstream UX method uh, for seeking strengths and opportunities in design. Expert reviews are conducted by a researcher without any player data. They're not empirical study. Expert reviews are focused. They're not uh, specifically not on attitudinal data. They're focused on two specific sections of this challenge at the top, behavioral and cognitive factors. What do players do? What will they do? Why would they do that? How will they think? What would they know? Not how do they feel? Not anything about their emotion. We'll come back to this a bit later. They may also utilize these expert review processes, something called heuristics, rules of thumb, which we'll also come back to a bit later. So now I've got a good idea perhaps about uh, what an expert review is. Uh, oh, and it outputs uh, a formal deliverable of some kind, sorry. It's usually a, rep a written report, okay? So it has to cr uh, crystallize into a report. And that's usually uh, a turnaround of maybe 48, 72 hours. It's pretty quick, has to be fast to turn around, maybe even 24 hours, okay. The first question I usually get asked about expert reviews is, uh, okay, but are they actually used in industry? Or we, we're all player data experts, so why are we doing this thing without player data? And the answer to that is, okay, sometimes. Uh, player data is, is, you're right, more uh, available in a commercial setting. Most of these labs, the colleagues around you today, have playtest labs specifically to get player data, such that they don't need to rely on just researchers' intuition. Uh, they are also potentially contentious, these expert review processes, because it's just a one researcher who has potentially lots of power to make change in the game and seemingly lacks the objectivity of this player data. Uh, they also, it changes how they're used in industry. But they are used, it sometimes, it does vary by studio. Why would you perform them then? When are they used? Because they can be conducted solo by a single user researcher with no lab, no players, they can have a really fast turnaround time. You can get an expert review done in just a few hours, potentially. But that comes at a cost. Because you've got no play data, you've got no safety net. You've got nothing to fall back to, nothing to measure, nothing to point at and say, hey, I've got evidence for this. So it comes with a cost. Secondly, they're used because they can be used breadth first. Playtests are often, can be focused on you know, bringing a new player into the experience, so you kind of have an, a weighted focus towards the start of the game. Whereas an expert review, because it's just you, literally you, you can hop straight to the end game, hop straight to the meta, focus just on the store. You can do 
different things, you can cover the whole game much faster than a player can play through the whole game potentially. So they are useful on that front. But again, this has risks. Because you can change any aspect of the game, no matter where it occurs, there's a huge risk there that your, what the suggestions that you're providing in an expert review can have game-wide impact game be, you know, and change everything, which is maybe a little dangerous. Thirdly, why do them? Expert reviews are a good vehicle for the application of best practice. As experts in user research and at UX and what have you, as a researcher, you know things, you know best practice, but it ha it's helpful to have a way to get that out, to communicate that to the development team. And expert reviews are, by the definition, because you're running, writing them, a good vehicle for that. Um, again, though, risks, right? Because it's much more highly reliant on the expertise of that researcher, that researcher having a good understanding of what best practice is, having uh, good product knowledge too. So again, it comes with risks. Lastly, on why performing them, this is specifically for those individuals seeking jobs in the room. Expert reviews are frequently used inside hiring processes to test your skills as a potential applicant, as a potential hire. Uh, so they're therefore useful to practice because they do stretch and test these core skills uh, about the uh, critical evaluation of video games. But it's extremely hard for juniors to close the feedback loop and make sure they're doing these expert review practices, uh, doing them well. All right. I'm going to cover something just briefly. What's in a name? Expert review is the documented name for this process. But that phrasing, in my experience, can be a problem. A game review is already a thing. A journalistic review has a very different voice to an expert review. And so even the, just the word review can be difficult. It can be, lead to misunderstandings uh, and yeah, leads to problems that are mismatched expectations. The word expert, too, can be difficult. Uh, the games industry is famous for its egos, and people can be quite protective. So, you know, entering with the word expert can, again, lead to misunderstandings. Um, to overcome this, um, just to thinking about how I do this when I'm talking to students about this, um, I try and talk around the deliverable, the voice that it has. I probably won't use these words. I always say things like usability assessment or evaluation formal feedback, maybe heuristic assessment. Uh, but just an FYI that although Google is full of wonderful information about expert reviews, just be a little careful about the phrasing. This talk now, so we all understand what expert reviews are and can do, this talk now is about how to conduct them well. But the rest of my content assumes that you have done the foundational reading. So if you haven't, pause the YouTube video now <laughs> and uh, read these things. Uh, there's a great one from Nielsen Norman Group. Uh, and a fantastic one from Interaction Design Org. They call it a cognitive walkthrough. It's a similar process. Uh, you know, you have good fun working out maybe the differences and coming uh, up with uh, you know, which one you prefer, maybe. So start here. Start with the foundational literature. It's good. Uh, I'll, I'll stick these on my Twitter or something. You don't have to take pictures. Um, there are also heuristic sets to guide you. Oh, sorry. Oh, God, which one? This one. Okay, there are also heuristic sets to guide you. I've not linked any here. We're going to come back to heuristics later. Okay, this talk then. This is the talk in the foundations track. So we're going to talk about foundational issues. We're going to talk about the core mistakes uh, and maybe slips uh, that I have had experience of uh, through my practice tasks that I ran with uh, members of this community. This talk is not a masterclass in conducting an expert review because it can't be. This is a life skill. It requires practice for the rest of your professional careers. Uh, what it will do, I hope, is give you some good ammunition, good pointers to really, really improve the quality of your outputs faster than you can by making these mistakes by yourself. OK, practice task. So uh, as part of the work I do in, in, uh, in my spare time, I ran a, a practice task with uh, volunteer members of this community through the Discord. Uh, 20 self-selected people who were seeking jobs uh, or, and, or were entry level, people like yourselves perhaps, um, conducted the same analysis on the same game in the same format. Cool. So this, the rest of this talk from now uh, is a meta-analysis of the reports that they provided. What are the common flaws and mistakes that they made compared to uh, some of you know, my hard, work, uh, hard, hard 
earned uh, experience in doing the same. They have the same game, the same remit, and the same deliverable format. So hopefully this will be useful. All right. A bit about the game that I asked them to review. It's called Major Gun 2 War on Terror. And I'm going to just show you some screenshots now for a bit of context. It helps speed things up later. Uh, it's an on-rails arcade first-person shooter with a... Uh, so you can't move the character around, but you can move the camera in from a fixed position uh, with a common uh, gun upgrade game loop. It's a free-to-play game. You shoot baddies with guns to get currency, and then uh, you get to spend that currency on better guns to shoot bigger baddies. Pretty common. Uh, in terms of the loop, it's very you know, co common across many different types of game. Uh, the control is you use your left thumb to move a name and your right thumb to uh, shoot the gun. You can also change uh, to aim down sights. There's also a sniper mode in the game, which is uh, in the tutorial. Uh, this the fire button still on the right and you can still move with the thumb on the left here. And this is the menu. This is one of the menus for gun upgrades. The menu architecture, again, it's quite common among mobile games to have this bottom mounted carousel where you can uh, select kind of gross categories, which changes the whole middle of the screen. And then the top bar has got just passive information about often about currencies and player progression. I, I'm sure you've all played games that look like this. Uh, this is the gun upgrade, and that's a tutorial prompt that says upgrade your gun. Uh, the main menu of the game has the different modes of the game in the center. So that, I don't know, what's that, like nine or something? Uh, where it says sniper, shooting range, and boss. Those are the game modes. Uh, on the right-hand side is, a, is the selected mode, the currently selected mode, some details about it, the sort of gunpowder you need. It's got that uh, bar at the top with the currencies, and on the left-hand side uh, is some metagame information. So this is about progression and unlocking stuff, chests and stuff, okay? A little further into the game, this particular game, uh, you unlock some extra stuff. At the bottom there, we've got some uh, consumables, so you can heal yourself and other junk. Uh, there's objectives at the top that change depending on the game mode, and a health bar top left, and uh, gun switching on top right. Okay, that was a whirlwind tour, but it's not, it's not imperative to know the game for the rest of the talk, but it's useful. Why this game in particular? Why did I choose this out of all the ones I could have? In my opinion, the core controls of this game are pretty standard fare. Uh, there's only so much you can do with an on-rails arcade shooter. Um, but there are some really interesting issues, in my opinion, uh, that are a bit deep, uh, deeper than that. So things about metagame comprehension, how the player progresses, how they will understand it, how the game communicates that to the player. Monetization model, what the player can buy, how, that, how clarified that is. Uh, In-game store usability, the UI uh, in general, the design and structure, there's some uh, breaks from best practice. And also there's some really interesting scenarios in gameplay, feedback during gameplay, where maybe the game state and the failure state isn't clear. So in short, I think it's a really interesting game to review. It's actually, it's a good game, it's a great game, uh, but has some interesting UX issues uh, to, to, dig, to dig from. All right, skipping to the end uh, of this task that I ran with these 20 people, uh, I got some fantastic feedback from the individuals that took it, and at least six of the participants, I haven't spoken to them all, have subsequently secured, uh, secured jobs in games you are, so go you. All right. Okay, the rest of my talk now is in the meat of it. We know what an expert review is, we know what I did and what I'm gonna to present today, and I've grouped the rest of my findings in these five sections. These five sections follow along with, roughly, the actual process of undertaking an expert review. So when you sit down on a Saturday morning or whatever, I'm gonna write an expert review today, this is the five steps-ish you're gonna take. And the rest of my talk is organized by these, okay? Starting with setting the scope and context. Okay, uh, wrong way, okay. So the first thing we're gonna do before we sit down is not play the game, but think about why we're here. Think about what we're going to do and what the development team need. The first of the common uh, flaws in these reports that were delivered uh, is, a dis is a not considering enough the objectives of the study. In a commercial setting, the reviews that you provide are never disconnected from the realities of game development that day. You need to know what the team is up to. You need to know what has potential scope for change. Uh, you cannot run re uh, research for the sake of it. In my practice task, I gave some fake information from the developer that gave a bit of context for why they were pro uh, proposing this study. It said, and I quote, 
our game isn't meeting key financial and retention projections. Can you help us do something about that? Yet, none of the reviews that were submitted focused on metagame, comprehension, retention, or otherwise. You must, first of all, agree <laughs> what you're here for. What is this expert review designed to do? So as our first lesson, professional valuations can't be disconnected from the studio's needs. Think, before you begin, what focus adds most meaningful value? And this is very difficult in a practice setting, of course, right? But you can imagine that game studios want to make players play for longer and pay more money and what have you and understand the game better. Uh, okay. Second, before we begin, it is imperative that we assess the whole game. Many of the reports that were delivered to me omitted a huge swathe of the game. Some of them completely omitted uh, core UI. Some of them didn't look at the store, didn't look at the gun upgrade screen. Some of them didn't look at gameplay. There were uh, reports that did not look at the gameplay itself and just the UI in the game. So I can't be more clear. The game, the game, is not just the shooty bits or the tutorial bits or the prompts or the onboarding. It is everything, a holistic whole. And that is the remit of, a, of an expert analysis. If you can't assess the whole game because you don't have time or what have you, do so constructively and deliberately and highlight the parts that you've not looked at. Yeah, I didn't look past one hour or what have you, but we should have, uh, our objective is to look at the whole thing. Every major screen and every core mechanic gets a mention in the report, even if, if it's to say, I didn't look at it, or for these reasons, I think it's okay. Every screen and every major mechanic gets a mention. Okay. Again, before we begin, and I've talked already about the remit of games user research, is to practice this voice that, uh, that games user research is designed to occupy. What are we here for? Games user research's role is to remain creatively impartial, in my opinion, to actualize the designer's vision, not to impart our own. So here's what not to do, and these are quotes from the individual reports, anonymized if anyone's watching that submitted a report. Things like saying, this game is unique and interesting, or that the developers should add more narrative to make it better, or that they should change the mechanics to add a red light outline around all of the characters to make it easier to find them, or that the difficulty was too high, or that the game was repetitive or easy. These are, these are all statements about players affect their emotions, how they may respond to this content, and they are fundamentally outside the scope of an expert analysis method. We can talk about these things, as game user researchers, but not with this method, not without player data to back it up. In an expert review then, you can make assertions about things like this, player perception, how players see and hear things, because you're expert in that. Cognition, how players learn, how they read, information architecture and the impact thereof, players' existing mental models or how they're constructed, because you're experts in that. And we can think about player behavior, how their hands work, how their uh, eyes work, etc., cetera, uh, and interaction design in general, because you're experts in that. This is, the re this is the remit of an expert analysis. So if you're tempted, don't be. To talk about things like fun factor, difficulty, pacing, engagement, value for money, monetization, likelihood to churn, likelihood of deletion, whether players will love it or not. This is not the method that will give us that data. Nobody wants fashion advice from their dentist. You're trusted as the user researcher to only weigh in on decisions that you have the remit for. And sometimes that means controlling your own remit and desire to talk about the cool, you know, how, how fun the game might be. And as a summary of this first section about thinking before we begin, we not only have to decide these things in advance, but we have to communicate these forward to the developers. Because developers, broadly speaking, may or may not have uh, low maturity in UX and not really understand the limitations necessarily that we're talking about here. So we have to communicate these forward, not just abide by them, but communicate them to the development team. Don't assume everyone understands your MO or your remit. Include it in your report. Uh, start your reports with an explainer on the objectives and limitations of the study. Your report will at some point have to stand by itself. You will not be there to present it to a development team. Okay. First stage done. We've understood what we're here for, what we're going to do, what we're going to cover, what we're not going to talk about. Now it's time to play the game, find some issues. 
let's talk about heuristics. Heuristics are rules of thumb. I'm sure you're already familiar. There are academically constructed sets uh, that to try to define possible game design flaws or possible interaction design flaws. There are very many out there. Oh, I'm sure there's at least 10. I'm sure we could all... Uh, we could easily do another hour on heuristics, by the way, so this will be a high-level stuff. Um, several of the reports listed... Well, let's go with this one first. He, several of these heuristic sets stray into game design. If you follow those heuristics, they will change the game, which we're not here to do. Second of all, several of uh, the reports listed broken heuristics as a reason to change something. Hey, you didn't follow rule 35, better change that. Heuristics are not a checklist. They are not rules that can't be broken. In fact, there are just as many reasons to break heuristics as there are to follow them. If we follow all the heuristics, the game probably won't be fun. We have to generate friction. That's what we're here for. We have to generate deliberate friction. So, uh, they're firstly, they're not a checklist. And secondly, they're not a stick to beat developers with. They're not used in game development. Only we talk about heuristics. They've got their own sets of, I'm, I'm sure, about of cool game design heuristics. They're useful as a tool to help build a mental model, but they are not a stick to beat developers with. Learn from heuristics, but don't use them like a checklist. Many simply won't apply. You have to practice parsing out the game design intent, which heuristics are being deliberately broken. You have to practice parsing that out from the game itself, not coming from heuristics forward, but from the game backwards. Okay, so we're playing the game now. We're writing down issues as we go. We're playing through the game, starting with the onboarding. One of the commonalities in the reports was to kind of fail, uh, a failure to consider the impact of time. It's tempting as you're writing down notes to just be like, oh, that's an issue, that's an issue, that's an issue. And to not consider that our brains aren't computers. We don't remember everything we see. We're actually, you know, we're pretty squishy. Brains aren't all that great at remembering stuff, right? So we have to consider the impact of time. The issues presented in the reports, you know, post or this play process, often underestimated players' ability to work things out from feedback, saying things like such and such a thing isn't clear when there's feedback later in the game design to clarify that through use. Uh, and they simultaneously overestimated players' ability to remember everything they're told. So if detail is only presented in a text box once, that's maybe not good enough. So just a, a pointer. Players will make mistakes. Players won't understand everything. That doesn't have to be corrected immediately. It's not necessarily an issue. And we're going to come back to this when we talk about tutorials in a minute. Negative experiences can lead to positive changes in player behavior. Doing something wrong and being punished for it briefly means you don't do that again. That's a positive change that hasn't required some explicit tutorialization. Okay. Next up, accuracy. Many examples of the reports contained things that weren't true. Weird, huh? They incorrectly asserted how mechanics worked and they suggested fixes that describe the actual implementation. This is a point about thoroughness. You have to go through and double check that your issues are real. It's not simply enough to play to walk through the game once. You have to go through multiple times, especially if they're high priority issues. You heard Randy upstairs saying that we are impactful as a discipline. All of these reports are taken seriously. And if you tell developers things that aren't true, you're undermining your credibility. Okay. Here's the sticky one, monetization. This is a free to play game and I deliberately chose it to make sure that play, uh, the reviewers were exposed to issues around monetization. Let's start at the beginning. <laughs> game development is a business. It pays your salary, probably, will do. It is therefore neglectful to omit from the review the ways that the game will make money. We have to find a way to expert review around the topic of monetization. Even though monetization is closely related to how players feel about a game. If they don't enjoy it, they're not going to pay for it. So how do we talk about this? Many of the reviews that were submitted completely omitted uh, looking at the sto in-game store. The way the players spend money, the transaction process, it, absolutely essential for this game returning uh, you know, the money that was spent in making it. It's free to play. You must 
you must look at the way that the game makes money as a high priority. Secondly, the reports contain phrases like this. It's dangerous when games start to push players to use real money. Players shouldn't be, or words to the effect of, players shouldn't be limited by in-game currency. The monetization system causes frustration. The game is pay to play. It's a digital gun marketplace. The game is pay to win. These were inclusions, these are direct quotes, anonymized of course. The Games User Research book uh, has a chapter on heuristics. I don't really, I want to call it out directly, but it does. Then there are other, there are other voices that say, say games shouldn't be paid to win. This doesn't gel with the most popular games in the world having paid to win aspects. So already that's kind of not true. Um, but even, even if you want to argue with this, then that's fine. Expert reviews are not the vehicle with which to do it. It, is, it will undermine your credibility with the game development team if you start telling them that they're not going to make money or they shouldn't make money this way or that you somehow know how to design a game model better than them. This is not the vehicle to make those uh, assertions. Uh, exploration of monetization is paramount, but you have to remain objective. Remembering if a game development is a business that pays your salary. Okay, where are we at? We're at stage three. We've decided what to do, we've played the game and got ourselves some issues, we've written down, done a cognitive walkthrough following the guides I posted uh, at the start of the talk. We're now pausing and prioritizing those issues we've already written. So we're going back through them again, as I suggested, is necessary, and starting to think about which ones are most important. Which ones get fixed today, as opposed to next week, as opposed to next month. It is rare for a usability issue to be atomic. If there's an issue with an understandability of something or the usability of a particular user interface, that is an issue with the game, of course, but it has ramifications often beyond that UI or that mechanic. It is necessary, therefore, to not only go through the game twice, but also go through your issues twice to find uh, information about how these issues you've uh, designed, sorry, uh, have found intersect with each other. I'll Pull out a particular example from this game as I think it's interesting. I, I don't want to have this talk rely on a knowledge of this game. But one issue in this particular game is that the post-game screen, which is after you complete a level, shoot all the baddies and you win, it contained some confusing language about stars and many of the viewers picked up about this. What are stars? How do I earn them? How do I get three? Is one better than three? What do they do after I get them? There, there are lots of potential questions as a result of the interface being unclear. People found that. Secondly, separate issue, the animation for earning star chests, which is in the post uh, in, in the map screen that I showed you earlier with those game modes, that there's a little animation there that shows how many stars you got rolling into the star chest. But it's really fast and it's super easy to miss, and you've kind of it's a bit dis you're a bit disconnected from the end of the previous level. So there's another issue here about the what went what was that animation? That was fast, that was too quick. So we've got two separate issues about one mechanic that individually sound like, okay, well, that's fine. I guess people work it out. But if you put them together, if you start to combine related and intersected issues, we're talking about the clarity of the entire metagame being completely unclear to players. It's got issues along the whole stars progression meta system, which unless you go back and find uh, these commonalities, may be overlooked. So read back through your issues. Parse them for commonalities on relatedness to find if there is a larger issue. It's essential as part of your process. Prioritization then. Prioritization is among the most important deliverable, part of the deliverable uh, that the expert review provides. What is the most important thing uh, that we need to fix next or focus on next? It's fantastic to find issues. It's, it's wonderful to be thorough. But prioritization is taken very seriously. If something, if someone says it's a high priority issue, if sorry, if you say this is a high priority issue, maybe the team works late to fix it. Maybe the whole rest of the development schedule changes as a result. Prioritization is paramount. We could easily do another hour on prioritization processes, frankly. In fact, probably more than that. The resource I provided to the junior uh, uh, and job seekers that provided th th this report was one by user focus. It's called the user focus prioritization tree. And I know that that's used inside uh, commercial games user research studios. 
to guide prioritization. So I thoroughly encourage you to use it. But even if you want to make up your own prioritization rules or it's not good enough for you, this user focus, this tree, uh, make prioritization rules and stick to them and explain the rules in your report. Much like doing math problems at school, it's useful to show your working. Show the way you, your thought process that says this is high versus this is a medium issue. Allow the developers to understand for themselves why something is so important, such that they can change the nature of their development. If it's useful to you, as a, just a thought process, imagine that the highest priority issues that you provide means a team stay late, right? There's a human cost to having a high prior. And uh, m some of the reviews had a lot of high priority issues, which, you know, there's a, we could do another hour on this. Let's not. Out of interest, the user focus thing is not perfect. It, f as an example of it not being perfect, uh, and it, it doesn't need to be, it's a high level idea. You look it up, it's a, it's a cool tool. But it doesn't consider things like monetization. So as another rule you'll have to add, any issue that prevents players confidently transacting with the game or permits use of a real world currency analog, things like the grenades you can buy for real world money in the game, uh, is immediately a high priority issue regardless of wherever it falls on this uh, tree or any, any, any other means. So, yeah, this is among the things that need practice as a junior games user researcher, finding these modifiers uh, that make that change prioritization. Okay. Where are we? We've prioritized our issues and we've parsed them to make sure we have a true understanding of what the problems are in the game. Now we're going to try and communicate those forward to the development team. Take my notes and turn them into something I can show people. Several of the reports, starting a bit with the basics here, several of the reports erred on the side of a patronizing tone. Writing, communicating through uh, anyone that sent, uh, you know, had a big long email chain, and you know, we all we use email a lot these days. We know that writing is tough. Maintaining tone and professionalism is tough, and it's really easy for things to get misunderstood in text, right? So you have to be really careful to manage your tone in these reports. And you know, uh, saying things like that things felt shallow or meaningless, excessively emotive words, using things like Skinner boxes, super loaded as a term, uh, or being a bit kind of curt and saying th things like fixed weapon progression. Uh, you have to watch your tone uh, and ensure you're maintaining professionalism. And in the same sense, um, yep, <clears throat> a few of the reports contain these things I'm going to call threat statements. Things like, well, exactly this, uh, such and such an issue will irritate the player and they're going to delete your game. Players will get confused and they're going to uninstall your thing. No, they won't. They absolutely won't. This isn't how players work. So first of all, no, they won't. Secondly, this is an exactly the sort of this is a perfect example of the sort of information that you shouldn't include. This is a an assertion about players' emotion that you have n absolutely no an expert review has no objectivity uh, to to, um, to provide. Third of all, though, <laughs> not don't just not do it, but third of all, <clears throat> uh, games user research is about building confidence in development teams. And it's about thinking about them actually as people in an empathetic transaction with the development team, sharing your knowledge, making the game better. Game developers, as you'll see as you go through your careers, they live with this fear that the thing they're making is not going to succeed, that the thing that they're making is going to not do that well, and maybe I won't have a job, right? Let's not talk about the games industry at large, but statements like this, not only aren't helpful to this project, but they're not helpful to the mental health of the uh, developers you're working with. They don't need more worries. They need your assistance. So watch your tone. <coughs> uh, yeah. Okay. A common, a common phrase among many of the uh, write-ups of these issues was words to the effect of, such and such a feature is not explained. This thing is not explained. This isn't clear to the player. If games were to explain every possible thing to the player with a prompt, it would be a very poor experience. Games user researchers voice, oh, well, here's some examples. Let's go through these first. The game doesn't introduce you to energy, which is that thing on the top bar, if you recall from the screenshot, or in-game currency. We have to demonstrate to players that the enemies will shoot at us. The power level of the guns is never really explained uh, on, on the UI. Consider introducing all resources uh, and uh, variously the uh, consumables as well. 
Introducing all of these things to a player is a, sounds like a terrible experience. Nobody wants more tutorial uh, content. And that's, broadly speaking, in my opinion, not the voice of games user research. We're not here to add more tutorials. In fact, if ideally, we should be taking away the tutorials because we feel confident not having them. That's one of the sources of confidence we can provide. <clears throat> so then, if we're not just going to tell players things, tell them this, tell them that, how do we teach people stuff? We could easily do another hour on teaching people stuff, <laughs> uh, but let's just cover the way I see this, just as a, a seed of a starter. Three different ways of teaching people things. One, familiarity. The player already knows that thing. They just need to apply that mental model to the thing they're looking at. You don't teach people how to use a telephone, right? They have a telephone icon. This is like uh, symbolism and icons. They know this from life, or they know this from other games. So we can make things more familiar. That would help. We don't need to introduce people to stuff. Discoverability. People learn by messing around with stuff, trial and error. By using it and seeing, you know, using this toy or this thing until some feedback pops out, like, oh, that's a thing. We can encourage that. And actually, you've got lots of information in your heads about how to do that really well. We can also strive for internal consistency such that people recognize, oh, that's a pink thing. There was a pink thing over there too. I wonder if, right? Only if those two things fail, only then, as a way of thinking about this. Perhaps if only if these two things fail, then we should be like, this is a pink thing and it does a thing and uh, you, know, you should click it sometime. Only do we need explicit tutorialization if it's the last resort. Now, maybe that's not always true and you make up your own mind, but maybe this is a useful way to think about how to teach players. As a lesson here then, you're an expert in how players think. Help the studio implement a system. It, help them design a game that helps players think in the right way. Advocating for more tutorials is not our job. It's too easy. Uh, you need to work harder than that. Okay. Psychobabble. Many of the reports contained, uh, you know, jargon from psychology. And it's tempting when faced with a complex subject to, uh, to try and either talk about it in ways that are pretty cool apply it to the things you know, or to try and impress the developers with your awesome psychology knowledge. But that's not what we're here for. We're not here to sound smart. We're here to make games better. So whilst it's, you know, it's necessary as part of your objectivity to say, I know this thing I'm talking about because of these reasons and this psychology, uh, leave the jargon at home. So things like alternative choice, Skinner box, you know, talking about motivations, unless it's really benefiting the team, leave it at home. Okay. Multimedia reporting. We could easily do another hour on how to write reports, <laughs> but you should probably not uh, write 10,000 words on every issue. Um, try, try and use other means of communicating information. Again, this is a source. Uh, this, this is something you ought to be practicing. How can you communicate information better visually, quickly, more effectively, more understandably, without using jargon? By using mock-ups, diagrams, flow charts, imperative, uh, minimizing text and yet not sacrificing understandability. Okay. As part of my report process, I allowed the reviewers to, to provide suggestions. Now, this is a hot uh, subject in games user research, whether or not we should be providing design suggestions. I'm not going into that right now. Uh, but what I can talk about briefly is that suggestions are real dangerous uh, because none of you and I am not an ideas person. We're not designers. We should let designers design. We're researchers. We should assess. Providing suggestions is, a, is a, a loaded and difficult thing to do. But broadly speaking, design alternatives are easy. It is easy to find another way to do something. There's loads of them. But actually improving design is hard. Why is your design better than that design? Understand the trade-offs. Why use a grid instead of a list? Talk to me about the trade-offs and if they're if you don't think the trade-offs are worth it, that's your argument. That's where your suggestions come in, is communicate why you think your set of trade-offs are better than the implemented set of trade-offs. You must ask yourself about all of these possible consequences, all of these possible trade-offs. How do they manifest in the game experience? Uh, this is uh, one of the reports said, you know, 
I've got an issue with the perceptibility of the enemies in the game. They're quite small and far away. There's a sniper mechanic, so you know sometimes you have to zoom, but they're quite small sometimes. So we should add a contrasting outline for the hostages that can be seen through enemies. Sorry, yeah, this is hostages. They're people you shouldn't shoot. Um, so it's like a Left 4 Dead style outline around the character so they can be seen through wars and stuff, I guess, right? That's cool. That fixes a problem, but then completely changes how the game works, completely changes everything about how difficult it is, where the fun comes from, where the friction comes from. The trade-off, I think players might accidentally shoot hostages sometimes, uh, has been made deliberately. So if you don't agree with it, cool. This is a cool vehicle to change that, but you have to be persuasive. Every design alternative comes with pros and cons. You need to practice thinking about them. A good way of doing this is to play lots of games. Cool, easy homework. Uh, but you need to study games. You need to actually play games with this UX hat on and say, I understand, pass through it for deliberate choices. A cool way of doing this is to play lots of games from the same genre because they face the same challenges. Taking Battle Royale as an example of a genre that has m major competitors in the space right now, they're facing the same challenges, things about interplayer communication and ra radial design uh, and state changes and maps. Uh, you can compare differing solutions to practice this art of the trade-off uh, and to find that voice within yourself and say, I understand why this design is different, maybe better, maybe not, than another. Okay. All right. Getting there. Good practice. How are we doing on time? Um, good practice. So uh, expert reviews are a good vehicle for giving good practice, um, for telling developers when they do something well. That's cool. Uh, but they often end in sort of platitudes like, good practice, there's a tutorial. Good practice, game's fun. Or the controls are fine. Um, and it's not surprising because genuinely good practice stuff is super hard to do. And again, this takes lots of practice. You're trying to pass through the game to find, as one indication of a good practice that you could, a kind of hat you can wear is, try to find violated heuristics that lead to better loadability or lead to a positive scenario, or lead to behavioral change. Because that's a risk. The developer took a risk by breaking the best practice or breaking the heuristic and saying, no, nah, actually, I think we, I prefer what the outcome of this broken heuristic than, than not. Uh, and the best write-up of a good practice issue should not be specific to that one scenario, but idea, in an ideal world, allow the developer to abstract from that learning and say, and either d deliver confidence or knowledge to say, oh, I can take that thing, that confidence, that understanding about breaking that heuristic and apply it to these other places in the game now and, take, uh, and make the whole game better as a result of finding this good practice in one area, trying to change a bit the way that they think. Okay. Organizing the report. Thank you. So. We're at the last stage now, you know, almost out the door. We've got our issues written up in a way that's beautifully understandable, minimal, multimedia. And now our job is to organize them into a report format, into a deliverable. Many of the reports that were delivered as part of this practice task were just a 20 page list of issues from start to finish, just maybe a bit of sorting, uh, but just a 20 page unstructured list. I put a limit on it of 20 pages. So one, one could see why you would want to fill all 20 pages up with issues. But a big old bucket of issues does not help the development team. As an example of how I approach this, find your own way again, practice. Um, I, when I do this, I aim for three to five logical sections of the report. So three to five titles where you, you've grouped the issues uh, deliberately uh, to help the team pass through it and distribute those sections out to members of, the, uh, of their team. You could, yeah. There's two approaches to ordering issues within those sections. One, if those issues are applicable to wide swathes of the game, all gameplay, all UI, all menus, you should order them by priority, highest priority first. If the issues you present are specific to a scenario, or you've got a game that's very linear so that you know, it cha things change over time uh, and each scenario is very different to it to the next you should you i would sorry uh sort them by time so start going in, in time order so hopefully that you know by all means practice come up with your own rules prove me wrong uh, but this is how i do it hopefully it's a good starter we talked already about expert analysis being a good vehicle for your expertise and uh it's good practice to talk about what happens next 
So you're a researcher, you know research methods, you've chosen to run an expert review perhaps. Uh, so expert reviews can be good uh, to talk about what's next, but not just suggesting a method, not just uh, you know, run a play test or whatever, but we need to focus on this, we need this length of play, we need this type of player. You can formalize uh, and help developers understand th the next method and why to help in improve uh, research literacy. And the very last thing on the list is an executive summary, which I requested as part of the task. The last thing we write is the summary of it all. Begin your report with a summary of the highest priority findings. So you can do just your mids, just your highs, you know, decide what you think, decide the story you want to tell. Ideally on one slide or maybe two if it's a, you know, lots and lots of issues. And we're writing this last because we have to summarize our findings at a high level and ensure uh, that it tells the story of the rest of the report. So even if you just look at this one page, I know uh, what the, roughly what the rest of the report is going to do. So it comes first, but it's written last. All right, cool. Let's summarize this near the end. Expert analyses are a fantastic tool, but are high stakes. It's easy to completely undermine your relationship with the development team through the nature of poor or unstructured communication or otherwise, or to inject bad data uh, that can have terrible ramifications. As a next step, if you want to do more of these, cool. Uh, do the reading on the process that I started at, uh, shared at the start of the slides. Uh, there's some fantastic information out there about expert reviews and how to conduct them for mainstream UX. And there's lots of li le life lessons you can learn about how games are different. Familiarize yourself with the voice of games user research. You know, go listen to Randy's talk again. Uh, and then seek deliberate practice. Um, so I'll be running this practice task again uh, if, uh, if people want to be involved. And indeed, the mentorship scheme, uh, this, this is a potential good uh, opportunity to run an expert review yourself and get maybe feedback from a mentor. Uh, or indeed, if you can, uh, come to Jess, Bree and Hannah's talk later uh, about working with development teams directly to maybe provide an expert review to them. So, you know, they're, they're quite easy to turn around. OK, thank you very much. That was perfect. I did okay on time? Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of content. Uh, I think there's time for questions, or maybe a few. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so my name is Gabriel. I have hey. a question about uh, monetization. Yes. Said it's oh. really risky to talk about it, but we should talk about it. Yes. Do you have any examples of how would be a good uh, way to approach that in an expert analysis? This is about remit. Uh, so I think that's, I'm not going to be able to scroll to it quickly, but that slide earlier about controlling uh, what you talk about. We can talk about perception, affordance, mental models, understandability and usability of, a, of an interface of a system. Which monetization is, is just a, anything to do with currency or spending money. Uh, any mechanic that's relevant to that has usability and learnability traits. It's just a lens on only those things that to do with money. Um, so with an expert review perspective, I'm not talking about games user research at wide, uh, large here. Uh, it is risky, but necessary to talk about monetization. Um, and it's more, more imperative uh, than almost any other topic to control, uh, to control your remit. But yeah, it's those, it's those same factors. Monetization is big and scary, but it's, it's just an interaction with the system. It just now has you know, uh, dollar coins or whatever on it. Uh, it's exactly the same lens. It's just a big and scary and potentially influential changes that can be made. Uh, so yeah, just maintain that remit. Understandability, learnability, and communicate that forward to the team. Hey, I know you're worried about your biz model. I know that you're concerned that players won't pay for stuff. That's cool, and we'll, do, we'll deal with that down the line. Like we've, we've got other methods that can help with that. Right now, this expert review is focused on usability and learnability of what you've already implemented in the game, uh, and you know, that's what we're going to focus on today. But yeah, it's big and scary, though, isn't it? <laughs> Talking about money. Um, this is really great. And I know your focus was expert reviews, but I feel like this is applicable to a lot of different types of report, like reports and methods. Um, I'm curious about like, what are your, uh, how do you practice feedback to someone? I think, I mean, I see things like, you know, don't, 
don't have a patronizing tone. And sometimes I want to tell my team, like, this sounds really patronizing. But how do I give that to them so they feel empowered rather than critical? Sure. Uh, Thanks. Such a good question. Um, We're still learning, too, about how to do this well. I mean, like, learning never changes. You know, we're always doing it. Um, For me, I think it's important to have a, a, a decent time distance between the delivery of the report and the, uh, when you're giving the feedback, <laughs> first of all. Uh, certainly not waiting when the report is too hot. People are still, you know, they're still worried about the things that they said and they are still a bit close to maybe to the findings. So giving a bit of time is important. Um, there is a podcast called Mixed Methods Podcast, which uh, I'm sure you've heard of, which has an episode on giving feedback in groups. That's specifically to inform uh, interview uh, interview technique improvement, but I propose that the same uh, format could be used to improve expert analyses too. So that's actually going back through the reports in a group setting, or in, a, in a meeting, and in a, in a jo- not jovial way, but in a, in a more, the tone is different, right? Yeah, it's a friendly space. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. Feedback is tough. Um, on the plus side, it feels really good. Doing these 20 reviews has taught me so much about my own processes. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be garnered as a mentor uh, from this process too. So if those of you that are seniors in the room, uh, do sign up to the mentorship scheme because you get so much out of it. Um, and maybe we can all do a talk next year about how to give that feedback. That would be wicked cool. Okay. Hi, my name is Salim. Um, hey, where are you? Oh, hey. <laughs> uh, so, y- in the heuristic assessment, what would you say are some tips to actually reduce jargon in these kind of reports since we can, can get heavy-handed sometimes mm-hmm. in our terms when uh, reviewing UI and mechanics? Yeah. So. So, first of all, Okay, lots of approaches. First of all, trying to use the game language. Trying to use the language of the developers themselves. They've got, uh, there's language in the game which you should try and reuse. So making sure you're using the official names of mechanics and features and that sort of thing. And you're familiar with game nomenclature at general. Um, There's a video game style guide. Is it called that? The one that, uh, there's a video game, I think if you search video game style guide, um, I, damn, I wish I'd prepped to know what that's really called. If there's a PDF online, it's free. It's a massive dictionary, a glossary of terms that are used in game development to try and give you the ammunition, like the short, essentially the sh- mental shortcuts or the l- l- linguistic shortcuts to get to the topics you want to really fast and make yourself really understandable. Um, so that's getting to your point quickly. In terms of making the point itself, um, I guess you just need to constantly evaluate. Well, why Why do I need to talk about Skinner boxes or, you know, uh, the the... the jargon Wh- why do i feel the need to do that maybe there's another way of understanding it uh another way of communicating that to the development team a much underused tool here is to ask questions or in your report ask the team a question you don't have to have the answers you don't have to make assertive statements it can be enough just to get the development team to ask the right question of themselves so the mental model I have for this is I imagine the boardroom and all the decision makers are in the room. What's the one question I write on the whiteboard and point out until they answer? That's the question that ends at the expert review. So don't, you don't necessarily have to make assertive statements that prove your worth or you know, have all the answers. Just asking better questions can be enough. Okay. Are we done? No more time? Thank you very much, everyone. I'm around all day if you want to come chat.